Today's episode is brought to you by Morgan & Morgan. If you have ever been injured in an accident, you may know from experience that oftentimes insurance companies will completely lowball you and your injury could actually be worth millions. But I think oftentimes people are afraid of the process, that it's going to be really hard, really complicated. But with Morgan & Morgan, they make it super, super easy. You can actually submit a claim in eight clicks or less on your phone. I mean, it could not be easier. And what's great is the fee is absolutely free unless you win. Morgan & Morgan does not settle for lowball offers. Just in the past couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, which was 34 times the highest insurance offer, $26 million in Philadelphia, which was 40 times the highest insurance offer, and $8.6 million in New York, 25 times the highest insurance offer. Bottom line is, if you are in an accident or injured in any way, you should know how to protect your rights. So you can start your claim with Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm at forthepeople.com slash Kendall. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. So happy to have you here today. And if you're new, then welcome. Be sure to hit subscribe. Now, today's episode is different because it's a continuation of my last episode. We went over the case of Jennifer Dulos. However, after recording it, I realized it was way too long to be one part. It was going to be nearly two hours, and we needed a bit more time to edit it and get it on your screens. Plus, I felt that it was just overwhelming and that I know a lot of you do enjoy longer episodes. However, the majority I know just from data um, process things better in smaller chunks. And I feel like Jennifer's case really needs that. There is so much to absorb. And I, I really want her story to be told and listened to in full. So I felt giving us a little break was a good idea. So if you haven't yet listened to or watched part one, definitely go back and check that out first or you're going to be extremely confused in part two. I will obviously have that linked below for you. Today in part two, we do have a lot to go over. Mainly, we're going to be going over more arrests and the recent trial that just wrapped up. Buckle up because there is still so much more that needs to be told. And that starts with how Fotis's attorney essentially slandered Jennifer in the weeks and months following her disappearance. So let's just get right into it. This is mind-blowingly offensive. But just a month after Jennifer disappeared, Fotis' attorney made a statement to reporters that this was a case of revenge suicide. I'm sure most of you have heard of the book and movie called Gone Girl. It's very, very popular. It's about this woman who fakes her death and pins it on her husband. And this is what Fotis' attorney said Jennifer did. He said that she had the, quote, imagination, means, and motive to disappear and make it look like her husband was responsible. And he based this claim on what he said was the fact that Michelle wrote a manuscript for a book that had the same premise as Gone Girl, which flat out just wasn't true. First of all, Gone Girl came out nearly a decade after this manuscript was written. And second of all, a friend of Jennifer's who actually read the manuscript said that it wasn't about that at all. And if Fotis' attorney had even taken a little time to read Maybe even some of it, he would have known that. But of course he didn't read it because that wasn't his goal. His goal was to make his client look innocent and to disparage an innocent woman in the process. Now, this is so wildly offensive in so many ways, especially to her family, to her children, to her. I mean, what kind of sick monster would say that Jennifer, a devoted, loving mother, would stage her own death and leave her children in order to ruin her husband's life. That is just such a wildly absurd, offensive claim to make. I cannot even believe he said that. It is so unprofessional and disgusting. Jennifer never would have put her children and her family through that emotional torture. And honestly, that whole part of this just really pisses me off. And Fotis honestly had just unbelievable audacity in the weeks following Jennifer's disappearance. At one point, and there's video of this, Fotis wished his kids and Jennifer a Merry Christmas, and this was months after she disappeared, which is just a nod to what his attorney said, that she's really still out there. 
It's it's disgusting. And at some point, Michelle completely turned on him. She even requested the judge to file an order that prevented Fotis from even contacting her. I mean, his literal co-conspirator and ex-girlfriend was disassociating herself from him rather than standing by his side and advocating for his innocence. So that says a lot if you ask me. But Fotis seemed to be doing just fine on his own. In July, he did an interview with NBC New York and gave the whole, I'm innocent and this has been so hard on me speech. I mean, you just, you got to hear it for yourself. It's been a very tough time for the whole family. Um, we're all very worried about Jennifer. How do you think the public looks at you? It depends. I think that the people that do not know me, they probably look at me as a monster. As a monster? Yes. Uh, and that is because of the information that has come out. And I cannot speak about what happened. Uh, so they take the narrative that they see from the arrests, the arrest warrants, and what is being reported in the press, and they draw their own conclusions. So I've already been convicted in their mind. What do you want people watching to know? I want them to know that this is a very, very challenging time for my whole family. And um, we just have to be patient to get to the other side and see what happens. Do you think you've been treated fairly by the criminal justice system? I do. You do? Yes. I think with the information they had, they did the best they could. And I understand they have tremendous uh, pressure on them. And it, it's also statistically, when something like this happens, 90 or 95% is the spouse. So I can understand why people feel like this. And your answer to that is? What's the when question? When people say, yes, 90% of the time it is the spouse. Well, What's it's your... 90%. It's not 100%. So, so when I, people... I'm in the 5 or 10% category. So, yeah, because, you know, people automatically say, oh, yeah, people say, the spouse did it. Mm -hmm. I know, but you know, I know what I've done and I know what I haven't done. So I, I, I have to stand and fight and uh, hope that the truth is going to come out. Do you have any thoughts about that, about her disappearance or what's happened? I do, but I'd rather not speak about them today. But at some point? Some point. He even had the balls to say that he and Jennifer were cordial in the weeks and months leading up to her disappearance, which is total bullshit. If by cordial he means making threats to kidnap the children and making Jennifer fear for her life, then sure, they were cordial. But anyway, jumping forward here, on September 4th, 2019, Fotis was arrested for the second time. This time, it was on an additional charge of tampering with evidence, and he was given a $500,000 bond, which he posted and was scheduled to return back to court on September 12th. In court, his attorney entered a plea of not guilty and told the state to, quote, bring it on. And a day after Fotis's arrest, Michelle turned herself in and was arrested and charged with the same thing. She was given a $100,000 bond, which she also posted and was scheduled to return to court on September 18th, where she did not end up entering a plea. As 2019 wrapped up, Fotis appeared in court several more times for hearings related to his charges in Jennifer's case, as well as hearings related to the civil case that Jennifer's mom filed against him in early 2018. If you remember, she was suing him for not paying back a $2.5 million loan, one that he claims was a gift. Pretty big gift, if you ask me. But anyway, the lawsuit was really the least of his troubles because on January 7th, 2020, he was arrested and charged with felony murder, murder, and kidnapping. And these charges came from the mountain of evidence that I've been sharing with you guys. And Prosecutors were very confident in their case. But it wasn't just Fotis who they arrested that day. They also arrested Michelle and Kent, and they were both charged with conspiracy to commit murder. On January 7th, 2020, Western District, in conjunction with Central District major crime detectives, were able to get enough evidence to affect the arrests of three following individuals. Fotos Doulos, who was charged with murder, felony murder, and kidnapping, with a court set bond of $6 million. Michelle Traconis, charged with conspiracy to commit murder, 
with a court set bond of $2 million. Kent Mowinney, charged with conspiracy to commit murder, also with a court set bond of $2 million. Now, I promised you guys a while back that I would explain more about who Kent is and how he fits into all of this, and I think now's a good time to do so, so let's... Let's do that. Kent Mawinney was not only Fotis's personal attorney for the civil case he was dealing with, but he was also a close friend. Now, if you remember when I talked about Michelle's interview, she claimed that Kent was at their house in Farmington on the morning of May 24th. And the story was that he was there to have a meeting with Fotis, but just like Michelle, he wasn't telling the full truth. First, he tried to say that there was no meeting that morning, but then after being pressed a little, he said that there was a meeting. However, Otis never showed up. Despite coming clean, though, investigators felt like Kent knew more than he was leading on, specifically about the phone calls that morning. Phone records show that calls were made between Kent and Fotis on the afternoon of May 24th. And to make an incredibly long story short, investigators believe that Kent was not only aware of the murder, but that he went to the house in order to help create an alibi for Fotis. So big no-no there. And when it comes to these phone calls, there's a story attached. And I know you guys are going to laugh at this the way that I did. When investigators asked Kent what he and Fotis talked about on the phone, he said that he couldn't remember because that morning he had taken a nasty fall down the stairs and he got a concussion and he couldn't remember anything about the day before. Poof, all of it gone. How convenient. Even more convenient, his phone was apparently damaged in that fall and so he had to get a new one. So basically he's telling them, I don't know shit about shit because of this fall. And luckily that did not stop investigators from pressing charges against him. And here's a little tidbit that you should probably know about Kent that will tell you a lot about the kind of guy he is. He was already facing charges filed by his soon-to-be ex-wife who accused him of spousal rape. So a real stand-up guy. Kent Mawinney, a Bloomfield-based lawyer, a personal friend of Fotis Dulos, and now a suspect in the murder of Jennifer Dulos. Kent Mawinney? Charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Mawinney was arrested by state police Tuesday and is charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Mawinney served as Fotis Dulos' lawyer in the past, representing him on civil matters, including a lawsuit filed by Gloria Farber, Jennifer's mother. In Mawinney's arrest warrant, his name appeared in both Michelle Draconis and Fotis Dulos' alibis for the morning Jennifer Dulos was reported missing, May 24th. Mawinney was interviewed twice by police. First, he claimed there was no meeting scheduled between Dulos and himself the morning of May 24th. But in his second interview, he says there was a prearranged meeting, stating he arrived at Dulos's Jefferson Crossing home just before 8 a.m., where he stood for almost an hour before leaving without seeing Dulos. Mawinney also claimed he had a concussion from falling down a set of stairs the day after Jennifer disappeared and had to replace his cell phone from the damage. Phone records show Mawinney called Dulos the night of May 24th, when Dulos was allegedly dumping bloody bags of evidence in Hartford. But Mawinney denies any phone contact with Dulos that day. Also, it turns out that back in the spring of 2019, Ken contacted an old buddy of his from the Windsor Rod and Gun Club. And to my knowledge, this club is essentially a property for hunting. And even though he was the founder of the club, he ended up leaving it for whatever reason. Well, it turns out that in March of 2019, two months before Jennifer went missing, he phoned up an old friend of his asking how he could gain access to the property. And then between March and May, investigators traced his phone to this area of the club, and one of those times was only days after Jennifer went missing. And what was Kent doing here, you might ask? Well, investigators believe that he was digging a human grave. And they say they have proof for this. On May 18th, six days before Jennifer went missing, two men were hunting on the property when they came across a hole that they described as 100% a human grave. The hole had been covered with metal grill grates, but when they looked beneath it, they found a blue tarp and two unopened bags of lime. And I'm not talking about limes as in the fruit. I'm talking about lime, the chemical compound that is known to disguise the scent of decaying human remains of decomposition. But at the time that these guys found this, they didn't feel like they had enough of a reason to report it because no one in the area had been missing and 
whatever. I mean, in my opinion, you find something like that, you report it. But luckily, they did report it, and it wasn't until after Jennifer's disappearance that they realized that maybe what they came across had something to do with it. But unfortunately, like I said, Jennifer's remains have never been found. And when they did a full search of this property, nothing came up. And by that point, someone had already filled the hole and made it look like it had never been touched in the first place. It's so bizarre and frustrating to me and so many others because it really does seem like that hole could have been meant for Jennifer. But going back to Kent's arrest and that whole ordeal, his bail was set at $2 million, and unlike the other two, he was unable to post it. So he sat behind bars until later that year when it was reduced to about a quarter million. And not to get too far ahead of myself, but Kent ended up being placed back in custody after tampering with his GPS ankle monitor. Super smart. And he remained behind bars until he was able to pay his bail again in December of 2022. Now, as for Michelle and Fotis, her bond was set at $2 million, which she posted, and his was set at $6 million, which he also posted. And if you thought that maybe things would be smooth sailing from here, unfortunately, that is not the case. In fact, things actually get really dark at this point, because on January 28th, 2020, Fotis didn't show up for an emergency bond hearing. And so police officers went to his house, and that's where they found him barely clinging on to life. That day, when Fotis's new girlfriend, yes, he has a new girlfriend at this point, went to the hearing and realized he didn't show up, she told his lawyer to call 911, fearing that he may have tried to harm himself, and she was right. When officers arrived at his house, they found him unconscious inside his car in the garage. Fotis had rigged a flexible tube from the exhaust pipe of his car into the vehicle in an attempt to end his life. And first responders did attempt to, you know, perform life-saving measures as he was transported to the hospital. But two days later, Fotis Dulos was declared dead as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning. And it really pisses me off. I mean, it's such a cowardly way to go out, you know, to not face what you actually did. A suicide note was found next to his body where he said he didn't kill himself because of the guilt of killing his wife, but rather the pain of being accused of it. He also said, and I quote, Michelle Traconis had nothing to do with Jennifer's disappearance and neither did Kent. And the fact that even in his suicide note, he maintained his innocence has made many people incredibly angry, including myself, and I'm sure probably most of you. If you're someone who believes that Fotis killed Jennifer, which there is such a mountain of evidence for that, uh, just you, I don't even have words for it. It's infuriating. To not give her loved ones that closure is beyond selfish and sick. If you are not going to face the repercussions for what you have done, the least you could do is admit it. Admit what you did. You know, I just, I don't understand. I, I will never understand. Now, as for the case against him, it's actually pretty interesting what ended up happening. The night that Fotis was declared dead, his attorney held a press conference saying that he would be filing a motion to move forward with the murder trial. He said he wanted to force the state to show its hand. The family is adamant that his name be cleared. As we are speaking, we have filed an unusual motion in the Connecticut courts asking to substitute an estate for Fotis Dulos for him as a defendant to force the state to show its hand in a trial filled with evidence we think that amounts to no more than innuendo and unsupported suspicion. So if you check the court pleadings, you'll see a motion to substitute the estate of Fotis Dulos for Mr. Dulos. It'll be a difficult challenge to persuade the state of Connecticut to go forward with a trial in the absence of a defendant. But having maligned the man for all time from coast to coast, and if not there around the world, we're asking for the right to clear his name. We intend to proceed on as if he were alive to vindicate him because we think he's wrongfully accused and we'll be seeking the discovery that we were supposed to get just the other day, supposed to begin getting just the other day. Now, this ultimately didn't end up happening. The case was dropped because obviously he wouldn't have been able to stand trial. But I think it's really interesting and bizarre that his attorney wanted to see all this through anyway. But as for Michelle and Kent, though, everything proceeded as normal. Now, obviously, the pandemic is unfolding at this point, and it did put a big delay on trial proceedings. However, the case against Michelle 
did end up moving forward and wrapped up very recently. So let's go over that. Michelle's trial began on January 11th, 2024, and she was facing a total of six counts on several different charges. One count of conspiracy to commit murder, two counts of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence, two counts of tampering with physical evidence, and one count of hindering the prosecution in the second degree. And in a shocking start to the trial, there were no opening statements, which was a huge shock to everyone, everyone following this case, including myself. I mean, the benefit to an opening statement is that you can give the jury sort of a, you know, big picture as to what they can expect to hear in the trial. But for whatever reason, that didn't happen. Thankfully, though, a very solid case was laid out over the course of several weeks. Now, I could sit here for literally hours and go over this trial piece by piece, go over all the testimony and evidence, but I've already laid out a lot of it for you guys, so I wanted to really just focus on kind of the highlights, if you will, from the trial. Now, this trial really started out kind of slow. Well, really slow. The first several days were a lot about setting up the scene and going through evidence collection, and it wasn't until Lauren, the nanny, took the stand that things really began picking up. She talked a lot about the affair, about Jennifer's fear of Fotis, and how she had witnessed instances where he was acting scary. Lauren also testified about the day of the disappearance, what she saw, when she became suspicious, you know, all of that. And I think it's important to note that a lot of this trial was about setting the scene, and there was a pretty large focus on Fotis, obviously. Even though it wasn't his trial, the prosecution had to go through, you know, everything he did, everything that pointed to his guilt, etc. And that's because without a body, they had to prove that Jennifer was murdered in order to then prove that Michelle conspired with Fotis to kill her and that she willingly took steps to hide evidence and mislead investigators. And one major thing prosecutors really drove home was the fact that in her three interviews, Michelle constantly changed her story and there, there were all these inconsistencies. This included information about Fotis's alibi, about Kent and his meeting, about what she was doing at 80 Mountain Spring Road, and more. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, you may notice that in the pictures of Michelle from the trial, she is wearing headphones. And that's because English isn't her first language, and her attorney requested that a translator be brought in to help her follow along during the trial. And it's the fact that English isn't her first language that her attorneys tried to argue was the reason for the inconsistencies and changes in her stories in her initial interviews. They said that she didn't understand what was being said to her and was essentially just confused because of her poor comprehension skills, which seems a bit ridiculous and convenient in my opinion. I mean, I don't know how other people will feel about that, but it's odd to me that she never once expressed that she wasn't understanding anything when they were interviewing her or asked for a translator, anything like that. It just seems like a convenient excuse to me. Plus, Michelle spoke English every day when she was with Fotis because he didn't speak Spanish, so clearly they were able to communicate with each other. It just seems like, yeah, convenience to bring something like that up when it comes to inconsistencies that you made. And of course, you're going to come up with, you know, any excuse you can when you're undergoing trial for such serious charges. So I'm not sure if I personally buy that whole confusion thing. However, the defense definitely did their best to drive that point home. Now, as far as the rest of the evidence, I'm not going to go back and go through all of that because we already have and we would be here forever. But I am going to remind you of what it was. The first thing prosecutors say proved Michelle tampered with the evidence has to do with the surveillance footage from the Hartford trash dumps, footage that Michelle identified herself as being in. Now, the defense argued that Michelle had no idea what he was doing and that she was just a passenger in the car waiting to go get Starbucks. but prosecutors brought forward some convincing evidence. That evidence being Michelle's DNA, which was found on some of the trash bags and a piece of tape that held two bags together. Now that is absolutely huge. Your DNA was on the trash bags of evidence. And then of course there is the alibi scripts, the document that outlines she and Fotis's activities on May 24th and 25th. And the undeniable truth is that some of the information on that document was false. For example, she wrote that they woke up together, showered, and had sex. But we know from Michelle herself that this was a lie. And that just brings me back to the whole point about not understanding what was being said to her because of the language barrier. 
because that that was just a straight up lie. That is not something you can explain away by being confused. If she was truly innocent, what reason did she have to lie about that? What reason did she have to make a fake alibi for Fotis? I mean, riddle me that. Come on. By writing that false information, the state argued that these scripts prove that Michelle knowingly and purposely misled investigators. Plus, we can't forget the fact that some of the information was just completely left off those pages. Nowhere on those papers was it mentioned that Michelle and Fotis went to Hartford. Again, why leave that giant piece of information out? The truth is not hard to remember, okay? You don't just forget something huge like that. And next, there was what happened at 80 Mountain Spring Road. This is something that I didn't touch on in much detail before, but I want to shed a little more light on it now to help explain what prosecutors say points to Michelle's guilt, and that is that she took several trips to and from her and Fotis's home to 80 Mountain Spring Road the day of Jennifer's disappearance. And as a reminder, 80 Mountain Spring Road is the home that she and Fotis went to where she was helping him clean inside the home and also helping him clean the truck and the coffee stains outside. Now, the first trip to Mountain Spring Road occurred at 1.36 p.m. and based on surveillance footage from a neighbor across the street, she stayed there for only five minutes before returning to her and Fotis's home on Jefferson Crossing. Michelle was then home from 1.41 to 2.01, and then she went back to Mountain Spring Road, where she stayed for just over 20 minutes before returning back home again. And at 3.55, she went back to Mountain Spring Road and stayed for less than 10 minutes and then returned to Jefferson Crossing, where they lived, at 4.04. And by 4.23, she was back at Mountain Spring Road. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, security footage from Jefferson Crossing showed that when Michelle returned home, the chimney was smoking. And keep in mind, this was May. This is not winter. What reason did she have to start a fire? in the middle of a spring day. Prosecutors alleged the reason is because she was burning evidence. Michelle's defense attorneys obviously try to argue that Michelle just loved burning fires, that she always would burn the fire in the fireplace, no matter what time of year it was. Okay, dude. Well, one of these trips was only 20 minutes long, and who starts a fire if you're going to be somewhere for 20 minutes. This is incredibly damning evidence against Michelle because it wasn't Fotis that lit the fire. It was Michelle. Also, none of these little trips back and forth were outlined in this alibi script they made. Coincidence? I think not. And that brings me to the next piece of evidence that the state says points to Michelle's guilt. And that's the whole saga with the red Toyota. We know that the red Toyota was at 80 Mountain Spring Road that day, and Michelle admitted to helping Fotis clean it. But according to her, she was under the impression that they were cleaning a coffee stain, which the state alleged she knew was actually blood. Well, Pavel Gumieni, the owner of the truck, took the stand and had some pretty powerful testimony. Turns out he went to 80 Mountain Spring Road on May 24th, just before 5 p.m., because that's where his truck was. And that's because Fotis had requested the previous day to drop it off there instead of his house. It was a Friday and the end of a workday, so he was going to retrieve it. And when he got there, he says he saw Michelle and Fotis in the driveway outside his car, and they looked super surprised to see him. He noted that the truck keys were visible to him in the door, but a few minutes later, when he went to grab the keys and leave, they were gone. And why were they gone? Well, because Michelle took them and left the property. And at that point, Fotis tried to convince Pavel that he didn't need his own car, that he could just, you know, use the company car for the weekend, which he was like, dude, what the hell? No, I want my car. So then Michelle had to go back to 80 Mountain Spring Road and give him his keys so he could leave with his truck. And I say all this, and I'm sure you already understand what I'm saying here, but the state is arguing that Michelle took his keys so that he couldn't leave, and Fotis is convincing him not to take the truck so that they could continue cleaning it. And because he did end up getting his truck back, they weren't able to have it detailed until five days later. Now, Pavel received immunity for his testimony against Michelle, and he shared several instances which outlined Michelle's hatred for Jennifer. In one instance, he claims that Michelle said, that bitch should be buried next to the dog. 
Okay. Which that had to do with the fact that during the divorce proceeding, Jennifer wouldn't let the kids go to Fotis's house to see their sick dog. Pavel highlighted this hatred that Michelle had, which helped prosecutors drive home what they believed the motive was, which was that Michelle hated Jennifer because of how difficult she was making things for Fotis in their divorce. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Overall, his testimony painted a picture of an angry Michelle and a strange slew of events pertaining to his vehicle. But as the trial wrapped up, of course, the defense tried to make the argument that Michelle was also a victim of Fotis. They said that she was tricked, that she was manipulated, and dragged into all of this unknowingly. The state, however, reminded jurors of each and every little thing Michelle did that they believe proved her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And the reality is there was no smoking gun. There was no one thing that said Michelle conspired to kill Jennifer. It was all these little things put together that the state argued put together the bigger picture. The defendant and Fotis Dulos conspire together to commit the crime of murder of Jennifer Dulos. That is count one. The elements that comprise the charge of murder are in agreement that the defendant specifically intended to agree with Fotis Dulos, and that agreement was to engage in conduct that that constituted the crime of murder. That's intent to kill and do. That there is an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Why did we spend so much time on Fotis Dulos the past six weeks? Because that's an overt act. And there's an intent requirement. The defendant had the intent to commit the crime of murder. So how do you know somebody's intentions? How do you know their motive? You look at what they do. You infer their motive, their intentions from their behavior. Look at what she did. Look at what Michelle Traconis did. Her acts, her behavior during the time of the murder. Look at what she did, her acts and behavior before and after the murder. Look at when she did these acts. Look at what she said. Look at what she didn't say. And look at what she lied about. So in the end, very recently, March 1st, 2024, Michelle Traconis was found guilty on all six counts after 14 hours of jury deliberation. And the footage of this is pretty intense. I mean, she is sobbing as the verdict is being read, and her family has definitely shared in her disappointment, stating that this was an unfair trial. (laughs) And today we are here devastated because has been a tremendous injustice in the trial of my daughter. The 49-year-old could spend the rest of her life in prison after a Stanford jury convicted her of conspiring to murder mother of five, Jennifer Dulos. Guilty. I love my sister and she's innocent and this was enough for a trial. The Draconis family shocked and saddened by Friday's guilty on all counts verdict, but not deterred. No, no, no justice. No justice. And as of right now, Michelle's attorney says they are planning to continue to appeal her conviction, even if they have to take it to the Supreme Court. And like I said, her family has been steadfast and very outspoken about their belief that Michelle is innocent. Currently, Michelle remains in custody on a $6 million bond at the York Correctional Institution in Connecticut. And if she can post it, which at this point she hasn't, she will be on house arrest until her sentencing hearing, which is scheduled for May 31st. But 49-year-old Michelle Traconis faces up to 50 years in prison if a judge decides that her charges should run consecutively. Very recently, March 21st, I am recording this episode on March 22nd, so this literally happened yesterday, but she was back in court facing a contempt of court charge, which stemmed from the fact that during trial, she had a sealed custody report opened on her laptop. Now, whether or not you think that is intentional is up to you. I don't know. So I'm really curious to hear what you guys think, because I know that some people out there have been split on this. I think the majority agree that Michelle is guilty. Um, But let me know if you disagree. Maybe you think that this was an unfair trial. I'd love to hear why. One thing, though, that I think we can all hopefully agree on is that Fotis is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in our minds, in my opinion. Gotta say that, of course, because he never got to have his day in court, which is infuriating 
I mean, what a coward after everything you've done to just opt out like that. I mean, it says everything about who this guy was. Even though the court of public opinion has clearly spoken here and everyone, I think, is in agreement that Fotis is definitely guilty, I value the opinion of a real court. And I would love to have seen that all shake out. I would have loved to see him have to face reality and be accountable for what he did. Now, as for the five Dulos children who, oh my God, have been through such unbelievable trauma in all of this, they are still in the custody of their maternal grandmother and their nanny, Lauren, is still very much a part of their lives. But what these children have had to go through these last five years is just beyond unimaginable and heartbreaking. On top of losing both of their parents in very different, very traumatic ways, They have also, in a lot of ways, lost their childhood. I mean, I don't know how any child could go through this without being severely impacted for the rest of their lives. I mean, I think it's just impossible to not have been. And um, as they get older and understand what really happened here, I'm sure that trauma will just continue to play out. It's it's beyond heartbreaking. I'm, I'm really at a loss of words to describe the pain that those children have gone through. I'm very grateful that, you know, they do have loving grandparents in their lives and that, you know, they also have Lauren as a constant in their life, as I said earlier. But, man, it is just beyond heartbreaking. I don't know what else to say. And I know I say children, but, I, you know, they are between the ages of like 13 and 18 by this point. So probably old enough to understand what has happened. I don't know how much has been explained to them, but God, it's just so fucked up. Now, as for Kent, his trial date is still pending, but his lawyers say that they feel confident that he will be found not guilty. In a statement released after Michelle's guilty verdict, they said that because Kent's name was hardly mentioned during her trial, it further proves his innocence, which is really annoying, but I guess we will have to wait and see because who knows how that's going to shake out. And not to just keep repeating myself, but it just pisses me off so much that Fotis could have just written the truth in that suicide note, that he could have said what he did, he could have admitted to it, and he could have told them where she is, potentially. I mean, chances are he knows, right? I could just go on and on about how much I hate this guy, but I'm just hoping that 2024 maybe will be the year that this family gets a little bit more closure. Maybe that they will find her, and that's why I um, made the donation towards this cadaver dog who... this dog has a great track record and I really hope that maybe this is going to be it. Um, So if you guys want to follow me on social media or maybe I'll pin a comment or something and keep you guys updated if anything is found, I can only hope that one day this family can bring her home and and have some sort of sense of peace. But unfortunately, that is all I have to share with you at this point. Let me know what you guys think. I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this one. Um, I will be back next week, of course, to discuss yet another case. But until then, stay safe out there.